I'm back. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about C groups, and I've been talking about C groups to people for years, but I'm going to talk about them for the first time in a way that I've not talked about them before, which is my presentations have always gone before. This is Secrets version one, which you're all using. Uh, and here's what's going to change in Secrets version two. But now Secrets version two has really arrived. So I'm just going to say, here's Secrets. By the way, this is version two. And I'm not going to tell you about version one. Um, soon it'll, well, for some of us at least, it'll be a distant memory. <laughs> For some of us with embedded products, perhaps not. <laughs> Alrighty, so um, a little bit of introduction. Um, I'm the maintainer of the Linux Manual Pages project. This is the project that documents system calls and C library functions. I've been doing this for a while, um, and I wrote a lot of those pages as well. I, I wrote a book. These days, um, I, I, my primary business, I'm a trainer. Back, by background, though, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a software engineer. And the stuff I'm going to talk about in this slot is sort of an introduction to, you know, what, is it, what are C groups? An example or two. Then a discussion of the kinds of things that we can control with C groups. And there's various things that we can control. Um, and then a little bit of the mechanics about how, how C groups, well, in particular, C groups version 2 work, how you enable and disable controllers um, and um, manage controllers to different levels of granularity in, when you're managing processes. And then uh, there's another slot that comes after this, which talks about some of the um, more um, fine grained details about how C groups work. <coughs> Okay, so a little bit of history. C groups, it's been around as a feature for a long time. Started in 2006, it was a feature developed internally on um, Google's kernels. Uh, but soon afterwards, it got released into the mainline Linux uh, kernel in the, at the beginning of 2008. At the beginning, there were three controllers that were all sort of CPU-related functionality, but Pretty quickly, various other controllers got added because people looked on this idea and they saw that it was good and they wanted one too. The thing is, the way this was done was a diverse groups who did their own thing, added their own controller for the thing that they wanted to control, and there was no sort of global oversight, no coordination, no one managing all of this. Everyone did their own thing and added their own bit. And very soon, things turned into a mess. Um, as I like to say, there's many examples of this in Linux, decentralized design failed us again. It didn't take long for people to realize there was a mess here and already by 2012, not only have people recognized as a mess, we're going to fix it. And the way we're going to fix it is, let's do it, do it over again. So 2012, the work starts. Already by 2015, System D supports Secrets version 2, which is even before it is officially released in 2016. Um, so 2016, four years later, Secrets version 2 is officially released, but it's incomplete. What I mean by that is there's a lot of controllers that were present in version 1 that were not yet present in version 2. And crucially, for example, there was no CPU controller in, in Secrets version 2, and that was a big blocker for many people because that was that's an important controller. But... Things did progress, and by 2019, Fedora becomes the first distribution to switch to using Secrets version 2 by default. Docker adds Secrets version 2 support in 2020, and suddenly everyone else is rushing onto the bandwagon as well. All the other distributions this year pretty much are switching to Secrets version 2 by default. So um, Ubuntu just switched days ago, Debian a few months ago, Arch further back in time, but I think it was this year. It might have been last year. Um, other distributions, uh, either they've switched already or they're going to switch soon. 
So there is a lot of existing infrastructure that depends on Secrets version 1, but there's been a lot of migration work done as well. And so that's why I'm going to ignore Secrets version 1 and just talk about Secrets version 2. I'm going to pretend that version 1 doesn't exist. <sighs> Nevertheless, it could well be that when you boot up your Linux system, you're booting into Secrets version 1 by default. And you actually want to do some of this stuff, try it out in Secrets version 2. Probably the easiest thing for you to do is reboot your system so that you actually use Secrets version 2 by default after boot. And there's a couple of ways that you can um, um, do this. Oh, and by the way, you can tell what you perhaps have when you boot up by grepping to see how many C group lines there are in your proc mounts file. And if there's more than one, you probably need to reboot. And <clears throat> when you reboot, you can use one of two boot options, you know, at the grub command line. Um, either you can say um, disable secrets version one. System D will then take that as a signal to say, I only need to use secrets version two. Alternatively, instead of disabling secrets version one in the kernel, you can tell system D, hey, just use secrets version two. And then it during the boot up process, it only mounts C groups version 2. It doesn't bother trying to mount C groups version 1. Either way works, but the second way, you could still use C groups version 1 if you felt inclined. Once we've booted, the C group file system, and the, the, this is the point really, that the interface to C groups is a pseudo file system, and that pseudo file system is mounted at a certain location. Um, either sysfs C group or sysfs C group unified, depending how we've booted. It'll be at one of those locations. The pseudo file system that's mounted is a, a, a file system of type C group 2. This file system, this mount point, is sometimes called the unified hierarchy. And the contrast here is with C groups version 1. In Secrets version 2, there is only one file system. But in Secrets version 1, there were many file systems in use, many hierarchies. This was pretty messy. And so one of the designs, decisions in Secrets version 2 is let's have one hierarchy, and people call it the unified hierarchy. So what is this thing? Cgroups essentially two components, a way of hierarchically grouping processes. So that you can have C groups that have child C groups that have child C groups and so on. In other words, a tree of C groups. That's one part of it. And the other thing is controllers. In other words, kernel components that can do resource limitation, resource measurement, um, uh, some kind of control on groups of processes rather than individual processes. So it's those two pieces. And as I've mentioned already, the interface is via a pseudo file system, uh, which means that you interact with C groups using in the ways you would normally interact with a file system. You could do it from the shell, and that's what I'll do in a few examples. Or you could write a program that does this, or you could use a daemon that does it for you, like system D. System D has an interface for controlling C groups. And of course, the container frameworks themselves are um, under the covers um, using C groups to do their management of processes inside containers. What sort of things can you do? One possibility is limiting resource usage to say that this group of processes only gets a certain percentage of one CPU, or this group of processes only gets a certain amount of memory, or a certain amount of network bandwidth. Conversely, you might turn things around and prioritize some group of processes so they get more of a resource. Perhaps they get favored for the network bandwidth for their outgoing network traffic. Some of the controllers, or some of the features of some of the controllers, are just about doing resource measurement. How much CPU time is this group of processes consuming? Or how much memory are they consuming currently? And 
Then there's some sort of funky controllers, things like the freezer controller. What the freezer controller lets you do is say, this group of processes, freeze them. Take them off the CPU, uh, off the CPU run queue. The processes still exist. They're just not getting CPU time until later on you thaw them. And there are some use cases for this to do with containers. So a bit of terminology. We've got the idea of a control group or a C group. What I mean by that is a group of processes that are being bound together for the purposes of resource management. In other words, th this group of processes is sharing a memory allocation or sharing a CPU allocation. But together, their use is being measured against that allocation rather than as individual processes. Then we've got the notion of a resource controller. And what I mean by a resource controller is a component inside the kernel that does some sort of resource limitation or resource measurement or some other kind of management of groups of processes. Um, so, for instance, there's a memory controller that limits memory consumption or a CPU controller that limits CPU consumption. Sometimes in documentation and inside the kernel source code, you'll see another term being used synonymously, a subsystem. Um, people talk about C group subsystems. I don't really like this term very much. It is quite common. Problem for me is that the word subsystem is so generic as to be almost meaningless. So I prefer the term resource controller. And the point about these C groups, they are arranged in a hierarchy. Each C group can have child C groups, which have child C groups. And this hierarchy is meaningful. So that, for instance, if you impose a limit on a high level C group, that limit applies to the lower level C groups as well. The interface, as I've mentioned already, it's a file system. And you interact with this file system, obviously doing file system operations. For example, to create a C group, what you do is make a directory on the file system. Simply the act of making a directory creates a new C group. When you want to get rid of that C group, you remove the directory. Each one of these directory, directories that we create has some automatically created files. And these files are used for a couple of purposes. One is uh, to manage the C group itself, uh, things like which processes are members of the C group. And the other thing is to do the resource limitation functionality. There are various files that you can, whose values you can update to set limits for the processes inside this um, C group. Some of the other files are doing things like exposing information about the C group, how much memory is being consumed, how much CPU is being consumed, and so on. So let's try an example. And I have got some slides here, but it's so much more fun to do a live demo because things could go wrong. Um, <clears throat> that's what everyone's here for, really, the mistakes. Um, let's... Uh, try some stuff out. So what I'm going to do is some experiments with the PIDs controller. And I mentioned already that the file system is mounted at a location like this. And the file system is owned by superuser. So I'm going to have to do all of these commands as superuser. So I'm just going to start up a um, superuser shell. It's a noisy prompt. Okay. So then I'm going to make a directory, which I'll call my group. Now, I'm going to put this shell into that group, at least in a moment. Um, now, the I want to check one or two things first, though. Sys I'm already in that directory. I didn't need to do that, but I can just... Okay. I've got a range of controllers available to me. I'll talk about some of these controllers a bit later on. Some of these controllers are enabled. I'll talk about these details a bit later on as well. What I wanted to just check there is that the PIDs controller is enabled. 
And that means that I can do PID's control in the child C group. And so what I'm going to do is move this shell into that C group. And the way I do that is by writing a PID into a file inside that directory. So uh, the file cgroup.prox. So now this shell is in that C group. One of the things you can do with any process on the system is cat the file proc pid C group. Um, cat the file proc pid C group, and you can discover the C group membership of the corresponding process. And what I see there is some colon delimited fields. If I was using a system that had both C groups version one and C groups version two, I'd see several records in this file. But because I've booted up into C groups version two only mode, which is the default on Fedora, um, I see just one line here. And that is the line, the one that begins zero colon colon is the line that tells me about C groups version two. And this is telling me that in the C groups version two hierarchy, this process is a member of the C group with the path slash my group where my group, of course, is relative to the mount point. Now, that files um, cgroup.prox in the uh, C group that I've just placed this shell in, um, we can write PIDs into that file to add processes to that C group. We can also read that file, and we see the um, the PIDs of the member processes. Now, one of those PIDs, of course, is the PID of the shell. Guesses about what the other one is? Martin. <laughs> okay, it's the cat process, because the cat process was created as a child of the shell, and child processes, when they're created, start their life in the same C group as their as the parent process. At least that's how it's always been, until relatively recently. There is nowadays a feature that the Linux kernel has, and this was added in the last year or so, where you can say, I want to create a new process that starts its life in a different C group. It's an option of the clone three system call. Some people wanted that functionality. Okay, now, inside that file, inside that directory, I'm looking at. There's another file, and this is a file that relates to the PIDs controller, and this tells me how many processes are there in this C group. Okay, there's two. One of them is the shell, of course, and the other one is this cat command that was just running there momentarily. Now, there is another file in that directory called, I meant to say, cat called pids.max and this allows me to find out what is the limit of the number of pids in the c group and has the string max in at the moment which means there's no limit inside this c group but i'm going to put a limit in there so i'm going to say echo five greater Max. Just verify that change. Okay, limit's now five. And then I'm going to say for J in seek one, five, in other words, five times, do run a sleep process. Uh, sleep for 60 seconds in the background and done. Now, what happened was that the loop managed to create four sleep processes, but when it tried to create the fifth, we'd already hit the limit of processes inside the C group. Now, what Bash is trying to do now is retry. So I couldn't create a process, and it's, it's going to try again a few times, and then it, it, then it gives up. Okay, but the point is, um, I've reached the limit of processes inside that C group. Um, I could, if I wanted to, say, cat pids.current, 
Let's find out how many processes are in the C group. I could try that. But of course, the cat process is a child of the shell, so I can't create a cat process inside that C group. But what I can do, and did I, I should have carefully noted the PID of my shell back there. Uh, it is this PID. What I can do is, from a shell that is in the, in, um, the root C group, the root uh, PID, or the root C group, I could then instead say cat slash proc PIDs, um, PIDs dot. Oh. No, I'm getting confused. What am I doing? I'm saying I should be, I, I'm, I got myself a bit confused there. SysFS, C group. Now I'm in a race against time, of course, because 60 seconds will run out soon. Okay, I was too late. <laughs> okay, let's try that again. Run that loop. Okay, and then down below, I've hit the limit. Okay, five processes in this group and the limit is five processes. Okay. I think I've covered everything that's on these following slides now. Let me just double check. Yes. Oh, one more thing. Um, to remove a C group, I just remove the directory. So I could now, and let's just, oh, my sleep processes are still running by the look of it. Yes. I could now say to remove the C group, which was called my group. <laughs> wrong window, wrong window. <laughs> um, RM to, in fact, I better go down here and become super user down here as well. RM to slash sys fs. C group, my group. Now, that failed because the C group I'm trying to remove is not empty. In other words, it either has child C groups or member processes or both. In this case, it's got a member process because the upper shell, the shell on the top window, is a member of that C group. So, what I'm now going to do is move that. Oh, well, I can't do it that way, can I? Oh, no, no, hang on. No, yes, I can. Echo dollar dollar into um, C group dot one. Just to make this clear, I'll write out the full path name. Okay, why did that work, by the way? Why, I couldn't run a cat command up there before. Oh, no, no I'm still, that's true, I'm not at the limit anymore. But even if I had been at the limit, I could have done this because echo is a shell built in, it doesn't create another process. Okay, now, if I now look at sysfs, cgroup, mygroup, pids. Dot current there's no member processes so now with a bit of luck I can remove that C group and it's gone one of the things I didn't have to do inside that directory I didn't actually show well we saw a few files that were inside that directory things like pids.current pids.max and so on and cgroup.prox I didn't have to remove those files before I removed the directory. You can't remove those files. If you try to, you get an error, okay? But those are just magic files that were made up on the fly by the kernel anyway, and it's making up its own rules about what we can do about this, do with this directory. And in this case, for C group directories, it says, yeah, you can delete those directories even if it looks like they have member, file, member files. Okay, so, Quickly then to look at what controllers do we have 
what what sort of things can we control with um, with C groups? And we've got a few different controllers. There is, by the way, in the kernel source tree, a documentation file that talks about the various controllers. What have we got? We've got a CPU controller. What the CPU controller does, of course, is let you, well, lets you do two things, really. Limit CPU usage and also measure CPU usage. And the CPU controller has a couple of modes of operation. There's a so-called shares mode or a proportional weight division mode, which is uh, the default mode. And there's another mode called bandwidth control. Uh, and you can mix these two modes at different levels in the hierarchy if you want. Now, the way that the proportional weight division mode works is at each level in the tree, or in each branch of the tree, there's a bunch of siblings at the same level here. I've got A, B, and C, and each one of those um, uh, C groups has some sort of weighting. It was called shares in version one, it's called weight in version two. And what happens is that all the shares at one level are added together to make a total, and then each C group gets its share of the total. So. The total there of A, B, and C, of course, is 4,096, and uh, that would mean that the processes in C group A are going to get one quarter of the overall CPU time, the processes in B are going to get one half, and the processes in C again are going to get one quarter. It's a hierarchical controller. They are all hierarchical controllers, but the, the limits are hierarchical. So the resources that are distributed into B can be further subdivided at lower levels. So in the C group X and the C group Y, we've got some weight values of 1,000 and 4,000. This means that the processes in C group X would get one-fifth of one-half, one-tenth of the overall CPU time. The processes in Y would get four-fifths of one-half, four-tenths of the overall CPU time and so on and so on. You can further subdivide as many times as you like using this, this shares, this weight mechanism. The way that this mechanism works, by the way, it only, the limits only apply if there is competition for the CPU. So for instance, if there are no processes in the branches B and C that are trying to use the CPU, but the processes in, in, in A are trying to use the CPU flat out, they'll get 100% of the CPU. The, the limits only apply if there is competition. Now, there is another mode, which is what's called bandwidth control. And bandwidth control really is strict limits. Even if no one else is using the CPU, you don't get more than your allocation. And the way that the bandwidth control mode works is the, the proportion of CPU that the processes get is expressed as two numbers. Uh, a quota and a period. And the quota divided by the period, of course, expresses a fraction, and that's the fraction of CPU that the processes in this C group receive. So here, for example, and I'm assuming that in every one of these C groups, the period is 100,000. Um, the, the, the processes in C group P would get 20% of the overall CPU time. Um, oh, sorry, I'll rephrase that. 20% at most 20% of the CPU time. Um, oh, sorry, I've, I've, I've jumped down a level. The process in A would get 50%. Below that, the process in P would get 20%. Process in Q would get 40%. Process in R would get 10%. And yes, there's some funniness in those numbers there. The children of A are oversubscribed. They've said that overall they can get 70% of the CPU, but the parent can only get 50%. So if P, Q, and R, if the processes there all try and use CPU, they won't get 70% because there is a higher level limit that says 50% in this tree. And as I say, this applies even if there is no competition for the CPU, which is nice for hosting providers to say things like, you know, you paid for this much CPU, that's all you're going to get, even if no one else is using the CPU. There's other controllers. There's a controller called the CPU set controller. What this 
lets you do is choose the CPU affinity and the memory affinity of a group of processes. Choose which CPUs a group of processes is going to use. And there's a couple of reasons that you might do this. One is that maybe you want to force most processes off a certain CPU so that some process that really needs a CPU, uh, that CPU always has that CPU available to it. Another possibility is you're on a NUMA system, non-uniform memory access system. Uh, these are boxes, you know, with very large numbers of CPUs, you know, maybe 1,024 CPUs. And the CPUs are organized into nodes where maybe there are 16 CPUs in a node. Each node has associated memory. And if a process execute, well, I'll rephrase it. If a process execute on a certain CPU uses memory, in the local bank, this is more efficient. All the CPUs can access all the memory on all the nodes, but accessing local memory is faster. So it is desirable to ensure that in a newer environment, processes, related processes run on the same node and they use memory associated with that same node for reasons of efficient memory access. This is one of the things that you can uh, bring about using the CPU set controller. We've got a memory controller. Memory control lets you limit the amount of memory that is being used by a group of processes. And for each C group, you can set up a couple of limits. Um, a so-called soft limit. If the processes go over that soft limit, they'll start getting swapped out you know, if there is memory pressure. And there's a hard limit. And if processes go over the hard limit, then the OOM killer comes out to play. The OOM killer out of memory killer is a kernel component that is designed to relieve low memory situations by choosing a victim, a process to be eliminated and therefore freeing up memory for the other processes. The OOM killer is it's just a dumb kernel component. What I mean is it doesn't have any intelligence about people's applications. It picks a victim. There is an alternative with the memory control where you can say, um, if memory gets low, send a notification to a user space process and the user space process might make a more sensible decision about how to deal with the low memory situation, like saying picking which process to kill, for example, or telling various processes, you know, it's, you know, we, we, we're consuming too much memory, you should terminate or you should release some memory in order to relieve this low memory situation. Other controllers. There's an I.O. controller. What this is about is limiting I.O. bandwidth uh, to, to block devices, things like um, SSDs, hard disk drives, and so on. Um, and you can, uh, again, a bit like the, the CPU controller, there's two kinds of limitation that you can do. Um, proportional weight division or um, absolute throttling of, of the traffic. Um, and you can do this on a per device basis, of course. There's a devices controller. Um, this is one that is quite important for containers because one of the things that you typically want to do in a container is ensure that containers only can access a very limited set of devices. And this is what the devices controller allows you to do, to choose which devices the processes in a certain C group are allowed to um, access. For instance, in a container, a typical use case is to ensure that processes can only access, say, devices null, zero, um, full, random, and maybe one or two others. The devices controller looks very different in Secrets version 2 than what was done in Secrets version 1. In Secrets version 2, the way that this control is done is with an eBPF program. Um, I like to say you're not a cool kid kernel developer these days if you're not trying to do something with eBPF because everyone's trying to do it. Um, and the way that this eBPF program works, you can attach an eBPF program to a C group and when a process inside the C group tries to access a device, open a device or create a device, the kernel kicks the BPF program into action and the BPF program makes a decision. Is that kind of device access allowed or not? Okay, um, we can do network traffic control with, um, with 
um, C groups as well. Nowadays, and well, I'll rephrase that, with C groups version 2, there is now the facility to attach again an eBPF program to C groups, and the eBPF program does shaping of the network traffic. So you can cause some C groups network traffic to be favored or disfavored. There's a PIDs controller. I've just shown you that one. Limit the number of PIDs in a C group. Of course, that's uh, interesting for people who like to prevent um, containers creating fork bombs that overrun the system. There's a freezer controller, and I mentioned this one briefly already. Um, what it allows you to do is freeze a group of processes, take them off the CPU run queue until they are later thawed, and then they're put back on the run queue again, and they can um, uh, uh, do stuff, execute. This is useful uh, in particular to do, to, to do with container migration use cases. The idea that you take a container running on one physical system and move it over to run on another physical system, perhaps because you're going to shut down the first system, but you want to keep the process inside the container running, so you want to migrate the container. And there's a whole lot of work that needs to happen to make that work, but the infrastructure is there. Part of the infrastructure is, you know, when we finally decide that we're ready to move the processes over the, the other system, we want to freeze the processes in the container and then move them over to the other system. There's a few other controllers I'm not going to try and talk about in any sort of detail, but I just mentioned there are two or three other controllers as well. Now, we've got, I glossed over at the start, um, uh, a detail about enabling and disabling controllers. And the point is that every, in every C group directory, there are two, um, two files, cgroup.controllers and cgroup.subtree control. And the first file tells us what controllers are available in the C group. And the other one says which of those available controllers is enabled. The reason these two files exist is to allow us to manage different controllers to different depths within the tree. In other words, manage controllers to different levels of granularity with respect to the processes on the system. So if we look inside the cgroup.controllers file, we'll see some list of controllers here. Now, I, I was just talking about the controllers before, and I said there were about a dozen, well, you probably didn't count them, but there are about a dozen controllers. And yet, when you look inside this file inside the root C group, you'll probably see a, sm a smaller number. Well, you will see a smaller number of um, controllers. And there's a couple of reasons why you might not see so many controllers uh, in this file. One of them is some controllers might also be in use in C groups version 1. And this is one of the points C groups version 2 is designed so it can coexist with C groups version 1, subject to a restriction, which is if you use a controller in C groups version 1, you can't use it in C groups version 2. So if I was on a system that had both C groups version 1 and C groups version 2 um, available, and I was using a certain controller in C groups version 1, then I wouldn't see it in the C group.controllers file in the root of the version 2 hierarchy. So this is one reason why I might not see some controllers there. There's another reason, uh, which is, uh, or sorry, there's another reason I'll come to in a moment, but there was, I was thinking of something else for a moment. Another reason you might not see a C group, uh, sorry, a controller in a certain C group is it's not enabled in the parent C group. But there's also a certain set of controllers that are the so-called implicit controllers. They are always available everywhere in the version 2 hierarchy. They don't need to be enabled or disabled. They're always available. Um, and because they're always available, they are not listed in this cgroup.controllers file. So example, an example of an implicit controller is the freezer controller. It's always available. Now, Maybe, rather than walking through slides, I will show an example. 
So just here I'm in the root C group. Uh, my current directory is the root C group. And if I cat C group dot controllers, there's a certain set of controllers that are available. And if I cat subtree control, there's a certain set of controllers that are enabled at this level. Now, the idea here is that if I enable a controller at a certain level, then I can do the corresponding control at the next level down. So what I'm going to do now is, well, in fact, no, before I do that, I'll make a child C group. Um, I'll call it group one. Now, I'm going to look inside that child C group that I've just created. There's a certain set of files there, a certain set of interface files. Now, I'm just going to refine that slightly, that output. The files that have the prefix CPU. Now, these two files, they just give us statistics about um, CPU usage uh, in the C group. These files are always present in every C group. There are also files that are used by the CPU controller, but they are not present in this secret at the moment because the CPU controller is not enabled at the level above. Okay, just to remind you, at the level above, the CPU controller is not enabled. It's available, but it's not enabled. So if I now turn around and enable that controller at the level above, and the way I do that is by writing certain string into the subtree control file. I've chosen the wrong string, of course. I, and then just verify that change. Okay, we now see CPU there. And now if I look in group one for the files cpu.star, a whole bunch of other files have just appeared. Those files have been created because I enabled the controller at the level above so that now I can do control in the next level down. And so now, for example, I could run a program down here. I've got a little program that burns up CPU time and tells us how much CPU time is being um, uh, what percentage of CPU time the process is getting. And at the moment, it's getting 100% you know, of the CPU that it wants. Now, up above, I'm now going to say echo, uh, let's say 20,000, 100,000. This is the quota and the period. That, that expresses that fraction that I was talking about before when I was talking about the CPU controller. I'm going to put that into group one, cpu.max. Just cat that file. Okay, the, the numbers are there. And then I'm going to move the process down below into that C group. So in to group one slash cgroup.prox and yeah okay we're gonna quickly enough converge to 20% CPU usage okay now just continuing on from this um, uh, this idea a little bit more. At each level, we can enable a controller in order to do control at the next level down. Now, if I look at the next level down in the group in the file group one, at the C group dot controllers file, I see a certain set of controllers available. They are the ones that were enabled at the level above. Okay, uh, just to remind you there if I say cat subtree control at the level above 
Okay, those were the ones that were enabled at the level above, so they, uh, sorry, yeah, enabled at the level above, so they are available at the next level down. If I look at the next level down to see which controllers are Enabled, to begin with, no controllers are enabled at that level. So what that means is if I created a grandchild C group, group one, group two, and then looked inside that directory, I'd see a small set of files there. Um, these are files that appear in every C group directory, but there are no interface files that let me, let me do any sort of control because none of the controllers are enabled at the level above. But if I now said echo plus PIDs into group into group one slash um, C group prox, uh, what did I do? Actually, I really meant to say CPU, but uh, yes, I, yeah. Okay, it's been a busy week already. Um, the subtree control. And then look in the grandchild C group. Now a whole bunch of CPU files, CPU related files have appeared. And this enables me to do CPU control at the next level down. Likewise, if I now said plus PIDs, now when looking at grandchild directory, there's some PIDs files that have appeared. On the other hand, if I tried to enable the IO controller, I get an error. And that's because at this level, the IO controller is not an available controller because it was not enabled at the level above. So, what these two files, the controllers file and the subtree control file, are enabling us to do is to enable different controllers to different depths in different branches of the hierarchy. And this enables us to do the so-called granularity use case, where certain controllers weren't managed to a certain depth. Uh, a certain, uh, we want to, perhaps we want to manage, you know, we want fine-grained control of CPU allocation to processes. But we don't care so much about fine-grained control of memory allocation. So we have the memory controller enabled to a certain depth in the hierarchy, but the CPU controller enabled at lower levels so that we can make fine-grained decisions about CPU allocation to processes. Is it, is it strictly tree-like, or can a child group have permissions that its parent doesn't have? I, I, I presume what you mean by permissions is uh, make use of controllers that its parent, and th that is the point that for these uh, explicit controllers, things like CPU and, and, and memory and so on, the answer is no, and that's, that's the very point. It has to come through the parent. There are these implicit controllers that are always available everywhere, but uh, for controllers like CPU and memory and um, I.O., uh, they can only be used at a lower level if they were enabled at a, a level at the level above. The parent needs to have that controller enabled. The middle layer would need to have the controller enabled. Okay. I think I've covered pretty much what, what, what is on the slides. Just let me just double check. Yes, we did an example. And I've talked about this granularity use case. And so the idea here is that we might enable um, some controllers to a certain depth, other controllers to a deeper depth, simply because we, we want to manage resources to different levels of granularity. Um, and this is part of our design. And that's as much as I have to say for now, but I'll take questions. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> <I'm>, Marius. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs>
let's try that. Let's try that. So we've currently got a limit of 20% there. So, but if I now see, where is that line? There we are. I could change that to... Uh, oh, so, okay, so let's just view the situation that we have, yes? So in group one, cgroup.controllers, cview is, is available, and it is ena enabled. That's for the children of group one, but of course the process down below is, is inside group one. Let's let's um, try saying echo minus CPU in group one C group dot subtree control. Okay, now that's but that's for the children of group one. This hasn't affected the processes that are in group one. Yeah. Now then the question is if I s disable the CPU controller in the root C group. Okay. The control's been taken away. Christian. Ah, it's a nice question. So if you've got some existing processes and you uh, enable a PID limit for the for the process that are already in an existing C group. What happens? The what the PID's controller is l doing is limiting the creation of new processes. The existing processes are unaffected. Now you might have set a limit of say ten in a certain C group, and maybe there are fifteen processes in the C group already. That's fine. They'll stay. And even the system administrator could move more processes in there if they wanted to by writing PIDs into the cgroup.prox file. But if any one of those processes tried to create a child process, the fork call would fail. And there would you know, be an error. Martin. Yes. So the question was, is the, the, the I mentioned that clone three, it's the clone three system call, has a facility for saying, I want to create a child process in a different C group from the parent, a different version two C group. Um, the way that you specify the C group that you want to create the process in is you open a file descriptor for a particular C group directory. You would need to have permission to do that. Yeah. So not just anyone can do this sort of stuff. Other questions? Yes, please. I, you're the first person whose name I don't know. <laughs> it's specifically devices. Yeah, device inodes. Um, no, but you're probably interested in other kinds of tools potentially things like se linux or app armor uh, c groups isn't the job isn't this isn't the job it isn't the thing for this job hello i don't know your name either but hey <laughs> um, ah you want to come back in the next hour <laughs> the answer is yes Yes, it's a feature called delegation. Yeah. Um, um, oh, Thomas. No, no Joachim, Joachim. Yes, you were sitting on that side of the room. I ran a class at the beginning of this week and Thomas and Joachim were sitting on the same side of the room. Okay. Well, the, progr the programmatic aspect of it is, you know, people sometimes say to me, you know, is there a, a C groups API? And I say, yes, open, close, read and write. And, and yeah, 
people have in the past invented APIs, but those APIs never seem to have really taken off. Um, I think they just didn't do the job well enough or give enough extra functionality beyond just doing it yourself. Um, perhaps a more common way that people might interact with um, C groups these days programmatically is via system D. Because system D has some interfaces for doing this sort of thing. Hello. You have to, sorry, you have to speak up for me. I'm just a little bit, I'm sorry. Well, did, did I, I, I catted that file a time or two, and we saw content in there, right? Yeah, and remember, these aren't real files. They're just made up by the kernel, and the kernel shows you what it wants to show you. Yeah. In, in, in a consistent way. Well, you might say you might say that you know real files and real disk files system wasn't made up by the computer. At least I like to think of it that way. <laughs> Some things are more made up than others. <laughs> Other questions? I think we're about on the hour now. Oh, we've not got a couple of minutes. So I will talk about some other features in the next hour. One of them is delegation. Um, uh, another one, what are the, oh gee, I forgot what other things I'm gonna talk about. A thread mode and um, delegation thread mode and something else. <laughs> okay, more detail about secret version two basically. Alrighty, thank you.